Okay, the way that we're going to have to get to the TVM solver is different for different people. So I'm going to have to take a couple of minutes and talk to the people that have the TI-83, which is the one I'm going to show you here. On the TI-83, to find the TVM solver, you want to go to your second and your X to the negative one key. It says finance. Okay? So any TI-83, TI-83 plus any of those, second, X to the negative one, and that gives you your finance menu. Now besides the TVM solver, which we will use, there is also on this menu, and we'll scroll down a little bit, down here at the bottom we have nominal and effective rates. Those words are going to come up in this last part of this lecture. If you have the effective rate and you need the nominal rate, and I'll talk to you about what those are, you use the option B and you put in the effective rate that you're given and the number of compoundings per year for that effective rate and it will come back and tell you what the nominal or the APY is, okay? If you have the APR, the annual percentage rate, and you need the effective rate, then you'll use option C and you'll put in the annual percentage rate and the number of compoundings per year, and it will come back and give you the effective rate. We'll talk about why those two are different. They're close, but they're different. But for most other problems, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the TVM solver, and I probably should have printed out one more page, so let me bring it up in the, um, PowerPoint so we can talk about it. talk a little bit about this page. Now on the TI-84 Plus C, that's the new really slim ones, the ones that look more like a, a tablet or a small cell phone. Those, that ha those have an apps button on them. And on the apps button, you'll hit the finance and then go to TVM Solver. On some of the TI-84s that are not the Plus Cs, Plus C means it has different colors of brass. But on the, the other TI-84s, you probably just select your apps key, okay? And on the apps menu, you'll find finance, and then there will be the TVM solver. And in addition to the TVM solver, you'll also have the effective rate and the nominal rate options, okay? Plus yeah, that, well, and actually plus CE is just enhanced. So yours should, you should see yours if you press the apps button and then choose the finance menu. Do I need to press second apps? No. Well, I don't know. Let me see. I just have to get Some people have just apps and some it's second apps. Yeah, just apps. Okay, and there's your TV installed. And the other ones I told you about are on further down the screen. Okay? Does anybody is anybody not able to find the finance menu on the calculator? Okay. So we can talk about what these things are. On your calculator, N is going to be the total number of compounding periods. It will always be the number of years times the number of compoundings per year. Okay? 
That'll always be the number of years times the number of compoundings per year. For example, if you have uh, a loan at five years compounded semi-annually, that means twice a year, five times two, N would be 10. I is the interest rate and you enter it as a percentage. You do not convert to a decimal, you enter it as a percentage. PV is P in most of the formulas. It is the present value, the amount that you initially borrow or the amount that you initially deposit. It could be either one. And I'm going to talk about that sometimes you're going to need to enter PV as a negative value. Okay? Because it depends. And we're going to talk about cash inflow and cash outflow to make that determination. PMT is payment unless you're talking about a mortgage or a car loan or credit card loan, then payment is usually going to be zero because we're talking about you're going to put a lump sum in and you're not going to touch it, or you're going to borrow a lump sum out and you may or may not make payments. So you enter zero for the payments unless you know an amount for a payment or the payment amount is what you're looking for. FV is going to be the future value, which your book also calls the um, maturity value, and usually in most of the formulas we see, it's, it's written as A. P slash Y and C slash Y have to be the same, and your calculator will not let you make them different, because that's payments of interest per year, and that's compoundings of the interest per year. So if it's interest that you're paying out every month on top of your regular payment, then your payments and your compounding are going to be the same. The bank's going to compound your interest on your whole entire amount of your loan, and you're going to pay interest on that whole amount of your loan for that month. Now, the cash flow convention is a sign convention. It indicates the direction of the cash flow Cash flows are entered as positive numbers, which means if it's an inflow, that means you borrowed money, okay? The money came to you. You took money out of the bank. That's an inflow. Cash outflows are entered as negative numbers. If you invest money, then you're actually spending money out on the front end, hoping to gain more money when it comes back to you at the future value. So if it's a cash inflow, then you put in a positive amount for the present value, and you'll get out a negative amount for the future value. Because basically you're putting money in at the, at the beginning, or um, you're depositing money at the beginning, and at the end the money's going to come back out to you as interest plus your original money that you put in. Your cash outflows are negative, so the future value is money you'll get at the end of the investment, so it's an inflow value. On the other hand, if you're borrowing the money, the present value's money you're gonna receive, that's inflow, and then at the end, you're having to pay back that money plus the interest, so that's gonna be a negative value. So looking at example five that we just did, the problem we have is the amount of interest earned by a deposit of $2,450 for 6.5 years at 5.25% compounded quarterly. The way we're going to do that problem is the number of compoundings is going to be that um, 26 comes from 6.5 years times 4. So it's compounded quarterly, okay, for six and a half years. Your interest rate in this case is going to be the 5.25%. So rather than have to convert it to 0 0.0525, we just enter 5.25% because it gives you a hint there that you want to put that in as percent. Your present value is going to be in entered as a negative number because you're gonna deposit the money into the account. So that's money going away from you into the bank. 
and at the end, then your future value will come back to you, so it will be positive. So we're going to enter this amount in as a negative. And then we're going to let the payments be zero because you're not going to make any payments. We're going to leave the future value to be zero, or if there's a number there from the previous problem, you change the future value to a zero. Anything you don't know in a problem, or if you know it to be zero, go ahead and enter zeros. So the only thing that's left then is the payments per year and the compoundings per year. So what they're going to do is they compound quarterly, so four times a year they're going to pay interest into your account because they've compounded the interest four times per year. Now, everything we're going to use this calculator for, our payment will be at the end of a period except one instance. And when we come to that one instance, I'll tell you when you should change it to beginning. There's only one type of financial situation where we're going to change that to beginning. Most of the time it's at the end. So what we want to do now is we put the cursor back up here because it says find the amount of interest earned. Well, that means we need to know the maturity value first. So we go up and we hit the alpha and the enter button to solve. Now notice that when you hit alpha enter, it says that the future value rounded off to an even number of cents is $3,438.78. And it's positive, move my cursor out here so that you can see that it's positive because that's money that's going to be paid to you. So it's your cash inflow and that, that's a good thing, that's positive. Now in order to determine what the actual amount of interest is. All you need to do is go and take your amount of your future value, 34, 38, 78, and subtract off how much you put in the bank to start with. So the amount of your interest is $988.78. So you just go to yeah, you want to keep the future value. And if you were to get to this screen and you forget what your future value is, there is a place to find it again, I think. But that's not it. It does. It keeps everything until you change it. This is just a shortcut. Yeah. I was trying to see. I don't know. I don't know that it actually. No, it doesn't. It doesn't store future value anywhere, or at least not that I can find. You're going to have to actually write the future value down and then subtract the, the present value yourself. But it does do all the rest of the calculation for you. So that saves you from having to actually do the problem. So that's how you do example five on your calculator. So what we want to do now is we want to pick up at example six and move forward and showing you how to do it with the calculator. So for example six, be still mouse. For example six, it says suppose. Susan Nassi invested $5,000 in a savings account that pays quarterly interest. After six years, the money had accumulated to $6,539.96. What was the interest rate? Now, solving that problem algebraically is not impossible, but it's annoying to say the best. It's very annoying. So what we need to do is we need to figure out what we're going to put on the TVM solver screen, and we're going to solve for the interest rate. So remember what the TVM solver's window looks like. Oh, I remember where the bears are now. You would go back to the finance menu and go over to the variables, and you can pick all those variables off here. So if you choose that, it will actually copy it back there, but if I were on the home screen and went there and chose that, then it wouldn't. 
So that's, I knew it was there somewhere. Okay, so on the TV installer, and you're gonna get used to actually drawing this screen, and on the quiz, I'll probably show you this screen and ask you to fill in the blanks for me, so I'll know what you put in. But the number of payments, her number of payments is going, or yeah, Susan, it's a her. Her number of payments is going to come from two things. It's going to come from paid quarterly and the fact that it's six years. So six years compounded quarterly is six times four. And we can enter that actually as six times four. And it'll do the multiplication for you right there on the screen, so you don't have to do all these separately. And then your interest rate is what we're solving for. So we're going to enter to begin with a zero because that's an unknown right now. And then we're going to go down to the present value. And the present value is the amount of money that she puts in to start with. So her present value is $5,000. And because it's money that she's investing, she's putting it in. That's a cash outflow for her. So it's going to be negative $5,000. And then the next piece of information we need is the future value. And since the future value is the money she's going to accumulate and get back, that's going to be a positive amount. And we're not going to make any payments. She's only going to put in the money the one time. So the payment amount is going to be zero. So no additional payments. Her future value then is the And then the compoundings per year, since it's quarterly, are both going to be four. So we can leave those both at four. And then we're going to leave that last one payments at the end, even though we're not, because we're not making any payments. It really doesn't matter which way you put it in, because you're not making any payments. So then you take your cursor and you put it back up there on the one thing you don't know. You can have as many as two zeros on you, which means that you'll take them both up with P slash Y and C slash Y. So fortunately, they never ask us what those are. They don't ask us what the compounding period is. They always ask us either the interest rate, the number of payments, the future value, the amount of a payment, or the present value. That'll be the zeros we might have. And you can have as many as two zeros and solve for one of them. So we're going to hit alpha, enter, and solve for the interest rate. And this says our interest rate was 16.7%. But that's her annual interest rate. What, what, what? No, it isn't. It can't be. That's the present value should be five thousand. Ah, ah. Thank you. Yes. For negative five thousand. Negative five thousand. I forgot to change it. Boy, that would be fun too. You would have to have a big interest rate to go from twenty four hundred dollars to sixty five hundred dollars. Well, I talked about it, but then I didn't change it. So let's go back up here and enter that zero back in. And I have learned too that sometimes if you have a non-zero number in there, 
and you hit solve, it will come back with a wrong answer. So always enter a zero for what you want to solve for to be sure that it doesn't, for some reason, think that there was something else there. Okay, 4.5% sounds much, much better. Your what? And that interest rate, because it's the annual interest rate, is the APR, annual percentage rate. Okay? So no formulas to sub into or to memorize or anything like that. Calculator takes care of all of that. You don't have to memorize anything except what these are. And if you think about the letters, they kind of tell you what they are. So there's example six. And I got an extra piece of paper in there somehow. So then we talk about effective rate. And the example we use initially, I'm going to try to blow this up so you can see it a little better, but I think you've got it in your notes. It says, suppose that you invested a dollar or you deposited a dollar, just one dollar, at 6% interest compounded semi-annually. The interest rate is actually 0.06 divided by two, which is 0.03 per period for two periods. And at the end of the year, the compound amount is given by this formula or by your calculator, either one, because up here, the number of compoundings, since we're gonna compound it twice and at the end of one year, so there's, there's only going to be two compoundings. And the interest rate is 6%, so we'll enter in 6. Our present value is $1. We aren't going to make any further payments. We're going to solve for the future value and the compoundings per year, since it's compounded semi-annually, is going to be 2. And if you'll notice, as soon as I entered the 2 and hit my enter button, it changed C slash Y to 2. So it's not going to let you accidentally enter in two different numbers for that. It's going to make you keep the same number. So then we're going to go back up and see what the future value is after a year. And it says it's a dollar and 6.09 cents, which we would count as a dollar and 6 cents. So we get the same answer. And what that shows you is that if you start with a dollar, at the end of the year, you'll have a dollar and 6.09 cents. And that's an actual increase over your dollar of 6.09%. Because if you subtract off your initial dollar, the amount you gained is 6.09 cents per one dollar. So if you change that to a percentage, that's 6.09 percent increase. This is actually what's called the effective rate. 
That is your effective rate. And notice here, your effective rate is actually higher than your nominal rate. Nominal rate is actually the AP, APR. It's always the annual rate. So in order to avoid confusion between those two, we always use R sub E for the effective rate. So just remember that the effective rate just has this symbol. You don't need to know the formula, it just has that symbol. Because you can get the calculator to tell you the effective rate the two things that you need for the calculator to tell you the effective rate, and it's going to look like this, EFF, is going to be the APR and the number of compoundings. In other words, the value of C slash Y. So we're going to go down, we're going to go back to the menu, second, X to the negative one, scroll down and find the effective rate formula, which is that option C, EFF parentheses, whoops. We need to actually be out of the TVM solver to do that though. So I'll clear it out. Second, finance, Go down to effective rate. So it should copy it back onto your home screen because that's where you want to start from. And then you type in the APR, which is 6%. And then you type in your number of compoundings per year, which in this particular case was two. And you hit enter and it tells you that the effective rate is 6.09%. Um, if you are within the TVM solver, what you want to do, regardless of where you are, if you need to get back to where you can do arithmetic on a screen, or you can pick a different function, the thing that you have to do is you have to hit second and mode to quit. Second mode to go back. Second mode to go back. Second mode, no matter where you are in your calculator, if you're in graph mode, if you're on your Y equals screen, if you're in the middle of some other menu, you hit second mode and it'll take you back out to the home screen. Takes you back home. Oh, to the home screen, it'll take you back to the, the previous screen. It won't take you back to the previous screen. It'll take you back to the home screen. There's really not a way to get back to the previous screen like there is sometimes in, uh, in a computer-based application. Yes. Annual percentage rate. Okay, so that just like the, the, the annual interest rate. It has to be the annual one, not the periodic one. When you've got a periodic interest rate, which in this case is your annual rate divided by how many times you do your compound. So this is called periodic rate. The 6% is called your annual rate, and then your effective rate is actually based off of your annual, your APR, and how many times per year you compound. And I will tell you, the effective rate, generally, unless you're compounding annually for some reason, your effective rate is always higher than what your uh, stated rate or your nominal rate is. It'll always be a little higher, okay? And again, I put a, a sheet in here, and I'm going to actually post the PDFs of the um, the PDFs of the PowerPoint, which is all this is is a paper copy of it. I'm going to post those for you in Shobi. So if you need this to go back and figure out how you went back to something, it's going to be in Shobi. You can pull those instructions back up. So here's another one of effective rate. It 
says Joe Terry needs to borrow some money. His neighborhood bank. Charges 8% compounded semi annually. So this is an APY or an APR. Actually, let's just stick with one word. I'll, I'll just continue to call it the APR. I'm, that goes along with what you'll see in the papers more so than the APY does. So the APR is 8%. And then compounded semi-annually tells you C slash Y is going to be two times a year. Now there's also an internet bank. The internet bank charges 7.9% interest compounded monthly. So they, their APR is less, it's 7.9%, but they compound monthly. So the C slash Y is going to be 12. So then the question is, you know, Joe looks at that and kind of just, he knows about numbers and says, hey, this is a lower interest rate, this sounds good. But if he doesn't carefully consider what the effective rate is, he might be in for a surprise. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the effective rate. So we're going to go second, x to the negative 1, scroll down and find the effective rate. And for his neighborhood bank, we're going to put in 8% compounded twice a year. So his neighborhood bank's effective rate is 8.16%. Remember I told you the effective rate's always going to be higher than the nominal rate. But then The effective rate for the internet bank, they charge 7.9%, which again, that sounds pretty good. They compound interest monthly. So that's 12 times a year. So their effective rate is 8.19%. So where is he going to pay the, le the lesser amount of interest? He better go to his neighborhood bank. Okay. So effective rate can be very important. Because we don't know how much Joe needs to borrow. If he only needs to borrow a few hundred dollars, there's not really a whole lot of difference in that line. But if he needs to borrow a few hundred thousand dollars, that's a lot of money. That's a big difference. Now the other thing that this makes really very easy is this whole idea of present value. This is the formula for present value. And essentially, it comes from the formula for the future value, which is up here. And what, you, what they've done is they've solved it for the present value. 
And either one of these is exactly fine. I mean, they're, they're both perfectly good formulas. And the fact that this has a negative uh, exponent on it, you know, that your algebra teacher's probably having a stroke when they see that. But that actually, there's nothing wrong with negative exponents. And you'll learn when we have calculus next semester, sometimes we like having negative exponents because it makes it easier to do what we need to do in calculus. So you'll have to get over your idea that negative exponents are a bad thing which probably won't hurt your feelings at all not to have to convert things. But still, we really don't want to deal with a formula if the calculator will find present value. And given that I've already told you that PV stands for present value, that should give you a good idea that the calculator is going to solve that little formula for you too. So we just need to do an example. And I'm going to skip over this one. It's in the PowerPoint, but I'm going to show you how to do it. So rather than use that, we're just going to work a problem. So what we need to do here is we need to figure out what everything is. So this says, Stacy needs to pay a lump sum of $6,000 in five years. So that's five years into the future. And she's going to need to deposit some money today at 6.2% compounded annually so that she'll have her money in five years. So the 6.2% tells me that this is the annual interest rate and the number of compoundings per year is going to be one. So when we go over here on the calculator screen and go to the TVM solver, the number of times it's going to compound for five years is going to be five times one because they compound once a year. The interest rate is 6.2%. Her present value is what she needs to know. She doesn't know how much she needs to deposit to have that money. So we're going to enter that as a zero. Well, she's not going to make any payments. She's going to make one lump sum deposit. And her future value needs to be $6,000. And that future value is going to come back to her. So that's going to be positive. And then payments per year is one and compoundings per year is one and then we go back up to her present value and that's what we solve for so this is her future value this is her number of years be five times one. This is going to be her interest rate and annually means that C slash Y, P slash Y are both going to be equal to one. And her present value, she needs to deposit $4,441 and 49 cents she needs to deposit that money that in order to have her $6,000 in five years Does anybody have any questions? So then you just take off the negative of the, yeah. of the present value? Yeah. Because all the negative is telling you is that's the money she has to pay out. So if, she's, if she was getting a loan, then that's the money she gets. That would be positive, but then her future value is going to be negative because that's the money she has to pay back. 
Present value and future value always have opposite signs. But in reality, you'll wind up when you answer the questions leaving out the sign. Why did you put 5.1 there? Five times one. I didn't make my time sign big enough. I'm sorry. No, that's my fault. That's okay. So it's five times one, which is five. It's always one because it's once per year. Okay? Any other questions? Because I think you're seeing here, you're not going to have any arithmetic to do. You just need to be able to pull the information out of the problem. And what is um, under the annual one? What is that C and there's something next to that? Is that C slash Y, compoundings per year, and P slash Y, payments per year, which is going to be one because it's once a year. Okay. So we have another one. We'll do present value. It says find the present value On the present value of sixteen thousand dollars, sixteen thousand is a future value. In nine years, so when is going to have something to do with nine? If the money can be deposited at two percent. compounded semi-annually, twice a year. So that semi-annually tells you that you've got a two that you need to use in three different places. So what we're going to do is we're going to solve for the present value and we're not going to make any payments. So we put in zeros for both of those. So n is going to be 9 times 2 which is 18. I is going to be 2% two, two present value is what we want to know so we'll initially tell it it's zero no payments future value needs to be $16,000 and compounded two times a year and paid out in interest two times a year so we go back to the present value and hit alpha enter to solve it and the, the amount of money that we're going to need to deposit today is $13,376.28, rounding up to the nearest cent. And one way that this is used, present value is used, is when you're talking about inflation. Because if you know your inflation rate, and you know what something is predicted to cost in a few years from now, do you know what your annual inflation rate is? You can figure out how much it's worth right now. 
or vice versa. If you know what something's worth right now, you can actually figure out the future or the inflated value of it by knowing what your inflation rate is. And that, that would always be compounded annually, not semi-annually, because inflation is only adjusted annually. So there's a lot of business applications to everything we're looking at in this chapter. Does anybody have any questions on that one? Does it sound like we're going to have an easy test next time? I kind of hope so. You hope so? Right now, yes. <laughs> yeah. This one's usually a lot better test for almost everybody. The test everybody likes in this class is the one over chapter two and the one over chapter five because it's all calculator. Calculator does all the math. Okay, number 10 is about compounding time. Come back here. It says, suppose the 2450 from example five is deposited at 5.25% compounded quarterly until it reaches $10,000. How long will that take? Well, we gotta think about what everything is again. We know we're not making any payments, so that's going to be a zero. You start out with 24.50. And since it's deposited, that means it's negative. The interest rate, 5.25%. Compounded quarterly, so that tells you this is four and this is four. And the future value is $10,000. So at this point, what we don't know is how many compounding periods are we going to need to make that happen? So we go up and we enter in as being zero at 5.25%, starting out with 24.50 in the bank, no payments, future value of $10,000, Compounded quarterly means C slash Y and P slash Y are both four. And then we go back up and we solve for N. And so what we learn is that when we solve for N, N is equal to 107.8 which we'll have to round up to 108 compoundings or periods. So 108 compounding periods. And since there's four of those compounding periods in a year, because it's quarterly, then we need to take that 108 and divide it by four. So it'll take 27 years. But if you have nothing but time on your hands and your grandma leaves you, $2,400, $2,500, and you can put it in the bank at that kind of an interest rate, and you can wait 27 years, and you'll have $10,000.
from a relatively small amount of money deposited. So when you figure that you always go up to the, the next year? You go up to the next number of compoundings. Okay. okay. Yeah. Because n is the number of compoundings times the number of years. So you just go up to the next whole number. You don't ever have a decimal. Number. No. Like no. Like four years, two months. Like right. Okay. You're always going to round up because number of compoundings has got to be a whole number. It can't be a part of a number. Anybody else have any questions about that? Okay, we've got one more compounding situation we're going to do, and then we're kind of done with this. We'll talk about continuous compounding. If you compound quarterly, you might want to actually make sure you get these numbers and words hooked up. If you compound quarterly, that's four times a year. If you compound monthly, that's 12 times a year. This one is odd because of a banking convention. How many days are there in a year? 365. Banks assume there's 360. I'll let y'all figure out whether that's to their advantage or yours. You'd be pretty sure it's to theirs. Unless you're trying to flush a check. Unless you're trying to flush, yeah. <laughs> they say that there's 360 days in a year. And if you take 24 hours in a day, then the last one says that you would compound 8,640 times if you compound every hour. Now I want you to notice, more important than what any of that is, I want you to notice what happens as your compoundings goes up. From 4 to 12, you get about roughly $5, let's say. Five dollars more. Now granted that's per year, but it's five dollars. Okay? If you take that same amount of money, you compound it instead of monthly, you compound it daily, how much did you gain? Less than three bucks. Okay? And if you go from daily to hourly, you don't even gain a dime. You gain about eight cents. Okay? So while there is some difference between quarterly and monthly, a little bit with daily, there's practically no advantage to compounding every hour, much less every second. And continuous compounding means every single second of every single day and every single millisecond in there. It's continuously compounding. But as you can see, it's not actually going to grow a whole lot more. It really isn't. Our national, our national debt does. Your national debt does. But the truth is, your national debt is actually not compounded continuously. Your national debt's growing because the borrowed amount is so big. And the truth of the matter is, how much the national debt actually is kind of varies depending on what time of year it is and which party's in control of what they want to say it is opposed to the other party. So there's a lot of politics involved with the national debt too. But if you get to pay your taxes, they'll compound. They'll come pound, they'll come take your house. <laughs> yes. They don't want to talk about what they've done with your taxes, but they want your money. And it doesn't matter who's in the White House or Congress, they want your money. 
Let's talk a little bit about continuous compounding because I promised you there weren't going to be any formulas, and there's not. Suppose that $2,450 is compounded at 5.25% continuously. There is a special formula for that. That special formula looks like this. Let me find my formula again. Well, actually, it's not one, it's n for the number of years times the interest rate. So the compounding continuously formula would be our 2450 times this irrational number e and 6.5 years times 5.25 percent interest. So that formula could be used to find the answer to part A. But you can also use the formula on your calculator. You just have to figure out what N is. Because there's no way to put in infinite. Which is actually what it's saying is that there's infinitely many compoundings. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the finance formulas to TBM Solver. And in order to put in the value for N for continuous compounding, and this, this is not in your book. This is what I'm telling you. This is not in your book. But in order to get your calculator to find continuous compounding for you, what we're going to do is we're going to take N to be 365 days a year, because that's what it really is, times... 24 hours in a day. Okay? Times 60 minutes in one hour. And we're going to get every single time 5,025,600. Okay. And then all you're going to need to enter down here is that same 5,025,600 for payments per year and compoundings per year. Now, I'm not quite done with N because that's the number of compoundings you still have to multiply by how many years? So we're going to multiply that one at that n times the six and a half years. So you have to be sure and enter in times the number of years. So our interest rate is 5.25%. Our present value is, again, since it's paid out, $2,450 and it's negative. And we want to find the future value, which is the compound amount. So we change the future value to zero.
and we'll solve for it. And here's what we get. $3,446.43. And if we go back to that previous page, what compounding every hour did. It gave us the same thing. Only now they let in the 8,640 and we used every minute, not every hour. So going every minute got us another penny. Okay? If Pearson tells you any of your answers are wrong because you did it that way, ask my instructor and I'll go change it. Because it'll only be off by a penny at the most. And then. By multiplying 365 times 24 times 60. There's 365 days in a year, 24 hours in a day, and 60 minutes in an hour. But I thought that was the 5.5, 6.5. 5.5, 600. Yeah. But what about the end number? Then by 6.5 years. Then times 6.5 years. Because you have to multiply it times the number oh, of years. Okay. Yep. That's how many times it compounds in one year. So then you have to multiply it times how many years? Okay? Now we haven't found the effective rate yet, but that's an easier one. Because to get the effective rate, we're still going to go to second finance. Go choose the effective rate. I think I need to quit before I do that. The stated rate is 5.25%, and since N is the number of compoundings per year, that's going to be 525,600. So the effective rate is 5.34%, roughly. Oh. Thank you. Let me redo that. So the effective rate is 5.39 percent. Okay? Now if you want these formulas, I can put those formulas on the test for you. This is your simple interest formula. And that's how you find the present value if you have the future value and you have a simple interest situation. These two formulas, your calculator does not do for you. So you will have to do these by formulas for simple interest. But your calculator will do all the others for you. So the compound interest
including the effective rate, can be done on the, done on the calculator. <coughs> And using this, we use the effective rate. And give it the stated interest rate and the number of compoundings per year. And we get around continuous compounding by still using the TVN solver. And C slash Y and P slash Y are both the 525 600. So yes, I'll give you the formulas, but I would suggest that you also know how to find those on your calculator because that's going to be way more efficient use of your time. Okay? Yeah, I'll just, yeah. Yeah, just show me what everything is actually on the screen. And a lot of times what I'll do when I give this test is I actually just print a picture of the screen there and let you fill in the blanks. So that pretty much takes care of 5.1. And we should be ready to go on to 5.2 and it is 7.20. So I'm going to let us take a break. Go somewhere where it's cooler, like maybe outside. <laughs> yeah, it is finally. So, and let's talk about section 5.2, <clears throat> and we're going to continue using uh, the TVM solver for everything, but we'll have to have some vocabulary building here. Let's talk a little bit about new vocabulary. We're going to talk first about something called an ordinary annuity. And one of the key things in TVM Solver that you know that you're going to need to do for an ordinary annuity is that your payments are always made at the end of each period, not at the beginning. That's very important. And what an ordinary annuity or an annuity, because there's two kinds of annuities, there's an ordinary annuity and an annuity due. And either of those is basically a sequence of equal payments made at equal periods of time, and that's called an annuity. It's an annuity if you're depositing the money into an account. That's important to know for a later word that we're going to use, which is called a mortgage. Because the mortgage is going to be when you make a loan, but it's based on the same, the same principles as what an annuity is based on. So an annuity is basically you pay into. Okay? So this is your cash flow is negative, <coughs> which means your present value is going to be negative, and your payments that you make along the way are also going to be entered as negatives, because it's money you're paying in periodically. And then your future value is the final sum on deposit. And your future value then, of course, is going to be positive.
because that's money you get paid back to you. And basically the future value is the sum of all the compounded amounts of all the payments plus all the interest compounded to the end of every single term. Now the time between the payments is referred to as the payment period. Usually we're talking about monthly payments, but those payments can be quarterly, they can be semi-annually, or they can be annual payments. And the time from the beginning of the first payment to the end of the last period is called the term of the annuity. So those are vocabulary words that you'll need to have under your belt for the next class or for the next test. And I would suggest actually all these bold-faced words, making yourself a set of index cards, and then on, on the front side write the word, and then on the back write what it actually is, what you know about it, so that if I ask you questions about those terms, then you'll know what they are, because they're important that you know. These are finance questions. So let's look at an ordinary annuity problem kind of get us started. Suppose you have deposited $1,500. That'll be your present value. You got it in your hands right now. But you're going to deposit at the end of each year. Which means that you're actually going to be making payments. because you're making it multiple times. And you're gonna do that for six years. So that's important to know. And the other important thing to know is that the account pays 8% and that's compounded annually, which means that you're gonna make six payments and you're going to have six interest payments. Okay? How much is going to be in the account at the end of the six year period total? Now, in order to visualize this, because like I said, the calculator is going to actually make math pretty easy. But in order to visualize this, let's look at it this way. <clears throat> you go in at the end of the first period. This is at time t equals zero. I want to save up money to put into an annuity. So you accumulate the money and at the end of your period, this is where the end idea comes in. At the end of your first period, you make your first deposit. And then you're going to make a deposit at the end of period two, and the end of period three, and the end of period four, and the end of period five, and the end of period six. So the amount of money that you have is going to be one, two, three, four, five, six times fifteen hundred. So nine thousand dollars. Okay, that's your money. Came out of your pocket. But then because of the way that an annuity works, what actually happens is you deposit your $1,500 and by the time you deposit your second $1,500, you're going to earn 8% interest on it. Okay? And then when you deposit your second $1,500, when you get to deposit your third time, you're going to earn another 8% interest on it. But you're also going to earn another 8% interest on the first $1,500. 
And then when you deposit your fourth $1,500, you will have earned interest on this $1,500 plus interest on this $1,500, plus interest on this $1,500, plus the interest earned on all three of those. So that by the time you make your last payment, your first payment has earned interest five times. Your second payment has earned interest four times. Your third payment has earned interest three times. Your fourth payment has earned interest twice. Your last payment only earned interest one time. So there's one, two, three, four, five payments. So your last payment, you got no interest. You just added $1,500 more to what you had. Okay, so this last payment earns no interest at all. That's important to pay attention to. That's what makes it an ordinary annuity. You get interest for five years on your initial payment, but on your last payment you get no interest. Now if it was an annuity due, what would happen is that you would deposit your $1,500 at the beginning. So at the end of your first year, you've earned your $1,500 worth of interest, plus you deposit another $1,500, and then you leave it on deposit. So when you get to year two, you earn interest on your $1,500 from the first deposit, plus its, its interest, plus the interest from your second deposit of $1,500, and then you'll deposit another $1,500 at the end of your third year, or at the beginning of your third year. I'm sorry, not the end, but at the beginning. So what happens in that case is even though this one didn't earn any interest because, or this one did earn interest, at the end, this one also will earn interest, okay? Your first payment, because it's made at the beginning of the period, doesn't get any interest until the end of the second period. But this one gets interest because it's at the end, it's at the, beginning of the last period. So your last payment actually gets interest. If it's an annuity due, that's the difference between the two. Okay. You all right? Yeah. I just kind of reached out to get my marker. Oh. Sorry. Some of these chairs will get out from under you in a heartbeat. I know that from experience. So let's talk about an ordinary annuity, an actual ordinary annuity and how we're gonna calculate for this. And again, we're gonna do the TVM solver, so I'm gonna go ahead and draw the TVM solver screen. Talk about where everything fits in. keep putting P C slash Y first, but it's P slash Y that comes first. Not that it matters because they actually have the same numerical value. So here's what we're looking at. Suppose $1,500 is deposited at the end of each year. So this is where we're going to come to the bottom of it. I may as well bring the screen up. So the payments are going to come at the end of each period. That's why that stays where it does. So it's not an amount, it's a when. And since this one is at the end of each period, then this is what you want to be highlighted. So then the other thing that we need to look at is, okay, this is paid as payments. There is no present value. You're making payments of $1,500. 
your present value is zero. You do not make a lump sum to get started. And then it says for six years, So that tells you that part of your number of compoundings is going to be based upon six years. And it says your interest rate is 8%. So we'll fill in the interest rate. And the interest is compounded annually. So that tells you that's going to be once a year. So P slash Y is once a year, C slash Y is once a year, and your 6 is going to be multiplied by one time per year, and it's going to just stay 6. And what they want to know then at the end, how much will be in the account at the end of the period? That's going to be the future value. So we're talking future value there. It is going to be negative. I didn't put it in. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. So yes, your payment is $1,500, but because it's outflow, you're paying it out of your pocket, then it is going to be a negative number, and which means our future value, when we solve for it, is going to be a positive amount because that's money coming back to you. It's an inflow. So let's fill in what we know. We know it's six years going to be paid interest once a year. The interest rate is 8%. Present value, we're not going to make any initial lump sum deposit and then add to it. It's just the present value is zero. We start out with nothing. We make payments of $1,500. We'd like to know what the future value is going to be, and it's going to be compounded one time per year. And because we're making our payments at the end, we're going to leave the payment on end. And then we're going to go back up to future value, alpha, solve. And at the end of our six years, we will have $11,003. and 89 cents. So that's the value of our investment, of our annuity, or value of our annuity, which an annuity is an investment. Okay? Now when you think about this, you, you are going to get back out $11,003.89, but you're going to put in $9,000. So the amount of interest you earn is $2,003.89 because you're making periodic payments. So you gained a pretty good amount of interest. And a lot of that you've earned because you earned interest on that first fifteen, on, uh, on that first fifteen hundred dollars for five years, and your second fifteen hundred dollars for four years, and your third fifteen hundred dollars for three years, plus all the interest on that first fifteen hundred carries over to what you have on deposit for your second compounding period, and then both of them carry over to the third and so forth. So it's a it's really a much better situation. that came from but it better not stop <laughs> okay so does anybody have any questions about that example somehow I got too many pages here
Now, if you actually were to do this by formula, and this is more to persuade you that you really don't want to do these by formula, notice that as we move into this where we're making payments and compounding periodically, that the formulas get more complicated, which is why we really much prefer to have uh, a calculator that's, that does this for us. Now at the bank, of course, they don't care around TI-83 or 84 calculators, but they have a computer program that does it for them. So they still don't do a lot of this stuff on their own. It's not about doing the math, it's about knowing what the math tells you. So I'm going to kind of skip over the formula part and let's do some more examples. Oops, wrong way. So we're going to talk about a career athlete, Leslie Mitchell, whoever she is. She believes her playing career will last seven years. That's going to, that's going to be one of the things, you know, everybody talks about you want to be an athlete, you want to make a lot of money, but they have a shorter term uh, viable time of making all that money. So they need to actually invest if they're smart. So she thinks that her career is gonna last seven years. So to prepare for her future, she wants to deposit $24,000 at the end of each year for seven years in an account paying 6% compounded annually. How much is she gonna have after seven years? Basically, she's thinking, is that gonna be enough for me to retire or to take a non-professional athlete job? So, her $24,000 is her payment amount. And she, her number of payments is going to be seven payments at the end of each of seven years. And her interest rate is 6%. But it's important to notice that that interest rate is compounded annually. And what you want is you want to match your compoundings pretty much with the number of, with the, the payment amounts. But you know, annually, if she could get something paid monthly, she would make a lot more money. So how much is she gonna have on deposit after seven years? That's gonna be her future value. So what we need to put into the calculator then, she's going to make seven payments and she's going to get interest once a year. Her interest rate is 6%. Each of her payments is $24,000. We don't know what her future value is. That's what we're going to have to figure out. And her P slash Y and C slash Y, her payments of interest and her compounding periods is once per year. So it's annually. So we go, we stay there on the future value, which we set to zero, and we hit alpha enter to solve. And at the end of her seven years, She'll have And if she's still doing well and she's still playing at that point, she may continue on. But if she decides she's got enough money to retire, then she can retire. Any questions? Now, again, 
notice here that this is how much she has on deposit, but her seven payments of 24,000 each means that 168,000 of that was her own money. But 168,000 subtracted from the 201,000 $452.10 means that she got $33,452.10 in interest. So she got better than one additional payment paid to her in interest. Does anybody have any questions? Apparently, Leslie is considering her options. Because she looks at the amount of money she'd have at the end of that period, and she says, well, you know, I wonder if I didn't invest $24,000 just at the end of every year, what if I deposited $2,000 at the end of each month, which would be the same amount per year, and that same account paying 6%, but it was compounded monthly? How much would she have on deposit after seven years? Well, the thing that's changed here is her payment amount is $2,000, the interest and the compounding period has changed. That's going to be 12 times a year. And her payments are going to be made at the end of each month for seven years. So N is going to be seven years times 12 months. So let's make those adjustments and see how that changes things. So we'll solve for her future value. she would have $208,000. So let's see, that's not quite seven thousand dollars more than she would have had otherwise for the same amount of money deposited okay same interest rate but a different compounding structure and a different payment structure so all those things make a difference so here again this is what I put into the calculator and the future value was her answer That'll be in the PowerPoint, but I like to show you as we're going along. Now, the other thing that we're going to talk about in this chapter is something called a sinking fund. And I know a little bit about sinking funds from experience because many years ago when I first joined the church that, I've, that I'm a member of in Johnson City, we only had one pastor, but we were a relatively small church. But we were growing, and eventually, at some point, when you're a larger church with only one pastor, your pastor gets spread pretty thin. So what we decided that needed to happen was that in 10 years from where we made this decision that we needed to have enough money in the bank to pay the salary of an associate pastor, that salary and benefits for an associate pastor, for at least three years without having to put that all in our budget all at once. 
So we started setting money aside to actually be able to hire a second pastor. And what you use to do that is called a sinking fund. A sinking fund is actually the same thing as an annuity, except that at the end of the time, you're actually trying to accumulate funds for a specific purpose, and it's not necessarily retirement. So it's still an ordinary annuity. So you basically set up a sinking fund to receive money that's going to be needed to pay off a uh, principal on a loan at some future time. That's also another reason to have a sinking fund. They're not as popular as they used to be, but a mortgage that was popular for quite some period of time was called a balloon mortgage. Does anybody know what a balloon mortgage is? Yeah, yeah you, you make small payments all along, smaller payments, they're not small, but they're smaller payments, but then at the end of your loan period, you have a big, huge payment that you have to make at the very end. And if you haven't planned for that, you're either going to be out of the house, surprise, or you're going to have to figure out how to, how to get a mortgage for that amount of money and remortgage your house, which means you're going to go through paying all those payments again. So it sounded really good to people. That's the reason they're not very popular anymore. It sounds really good to people to think, well, I can't afford that big payment. But then they find out at the end, well, guess what? You're just going to have to pay a loan if you want to keep your house. So sinking funds are one use of the idea of an annuity. So this is an example. I hope that didn't do anything. I just wanted it to go away. Uh, experts say that the baby boom generation, which is Americans born between 1946 and 1960, that would be a lot of my colleagues can't count on a company pension or social security to provide for comfortable retirements like their parents did so it's recommended that they start to serve, start to save early and regularly and Beth is a baby boomer and she's decided to deposit $200 a month for 20 years into an account that pays 7.2 percent interest compounded monthly how much is she going to have in the account at the end of her 20 years so she's Basically, this is just an annuity, but she has a goal for it. That's the only difference in a sinking fund and an ordinary or a, um, any kind of an annuity. It doesn't matter which kind of annuity it is. Is a sinking fund is an annuity, but there is a specific goal for that annuity. So how much is in the account at the end of 20 years? Okay, 20 years means that her value of N is going to be 20 years times how many times she's going to pay <coughs> and it says she's going to pay each month so that'll be 12 times a year her payment amount is going to be 200 her compounding period is monthly, so that means it's going to be 12. And of course, how much she's going to have in her account at the end is going to be her future value. So we have everything we need to know now to actually put this into the calculator. So her number of payments is going to be 12 payments a year for 20 years, which is 240. Her interest rate is 7.2%. An example that we have in our notes is actually 7%. Okay, I must have forgotten the, and I'm glad you caught that because I caught it someplace else, but I didn't catch it here, so it's 7%. We're not interested in the present value. We're only interested in her amount of her payments, which is $200. We don't know the future value, but her payments per year is 12 and her compoundings per year is 12. So we'll go back and solve for her future value. And her future value for her account 
is Now that's probably if she was born, let's say, in 1960, and it is now 19 or uh, 2017. Then she is pretty darn old. <laughs> she is 57 years old. That's not a whole lot of money to retire on if you're only 57. You're going to run out of money. Okay. Sounds like a lot of money if you're young starting out thing, thinking, you know, I wish I had that amount of money right now. But for somebody retiring and not having a steady income, that's not a lot of money. So she thinks she needs $130,000. Apparently she's got some other money stashed somewhere else because that's not enough money either. But she thinks she needs to accumulate $130,000 in the 20 year period to have enough for retirement. What kind of interest rate would provide that amount? Well, we do the same thing. We enter our future value as $130,000. And we're gonna assume that she's still depositing monthly at her $200 a month for seven years. And what she wants to know now is not her future value, but her interest rate. So we'll enter in a zero, and then alpha enter to solve for it, and something is not right. What did I not put in right? Oh, I uh, kind of left out some zeros that were kind of important. 13,000 and 130,000 are vastly different. So she would need an 8.78% interest rate. Since you're all are business majors, do you know any place she's gonna get that kind of return? 8% return? Yeah. Nope. Probably not. We are the loan center. <laughs> going to the going to the long shark business might be. And you wouldn't make that eight point seven nine. I was saying eight point eight. How would you round that? Uh, let me pull back on that and see. Yeah, I would call it eight point seven nine percent, or I would actually put the thing put that down. Lost the one on something. There it is. So realistically, since they don't usually go to two percentage points on interest rates, realistically she's going to need an 8.8 percent .8 loan or an 8.8 percent .8 annuity. Okay. So what they probably need to do is she probably needs to make her payments bigger. So here again, there's your complicated formula. There's your hero, the formula buster. Now one thing to notice when you're calculating a sinking fund payment, you may have to round the periodic payment up if you're solving to decide how much that you need to actually deposit at each of, the, each of your periods. You may have to round it up to the nearest cent to be able to ensure that there's enough money in for that specified amount in the future. So you always want to check your solution. So here's her, here's her issue again. Suppose she can't get that higher interest rate. I'm pretty sure she can. 
and she still needs $130,000 in 20 years. So to meet her goal, she's going to have to increase her monthly payment. How much payment does she need to make? So we still have, and this should be 7.0, not 7, or just 7%. So I'm going to put in the 7 here. And we're going to put in 0 for the payment amount and keep the same future value. And she's still making monthly payments, so it's, it's uh, 20 years times... Um, 12 months a year. So her future value still needs to be $130,000. How much payment should she make? So we hit alpha solve. And she needs to increase her payment. It's sad that this one came out of the book because they're the ones that made the typo. Her payment amount should be $249.56. $249 and round up to 56. Even if this was 0.553, I would still round up to 56 cents because the bank does, they don't let you just drop off that partial cent. They'll actually charge you for it. So you have to get it to get it back. So her payments need to be 249.56. Okay. Any questions so far? Because we're just about done. Okay, now what you can do, she can actually monitor how much is in her account per year, but you have to use a graphing calculator to make the table to show that. So what I'm going to show you is what the screen looks like, but I want just the formula by itself. Okay, here we go. R is going to be her payment amount. We're just going to actually use the correct payment amount. So what was the correct payment amount? 240. Forty-nine fifty-six. Her periodic interest rate was actually 0 .07 divided by 12. And her number of compoundings should be, and that might be where I messed up because I don't, that's going to be a monthly amount. That's what we want to be X in the calculator. And then this interest rate down here also is 0.07 divided by 12. So let's let me think through how we're how we're gonna do the parentheses. Hmm? Minus one. Well what what actually happens here, thinking about your your rules for exponents, R has got to be multiplied by this whole thing. And then what we want to happen first in some of these is we need to have this completed after this division. We'll need to have this completed separately, so there's going to have to be parentheses around this. And then we want it to take that interest rate and add one to it before you raise it to the power. So that needs its own set of parentheses. And then the end, you don't really need the parentheses because it's not subtracting it from the end. It's actually going to subtract it from this whole thing. The exponent is going to be applied before subtraction because in order of operations, you do what's inside the parentheses, then the exponents. You multiply and divide within the parentheses, and the last thing you do is the subtraction. So I don't think you're going to need that many parentheses. So let me see if I can wipe this out. 
and try again. So the initial 249.56 is going to be multiplied by the entire quantity that's in that red box and the numerator of what's in that red box consists of the quantity one plus the interest rate 0 0.07 divided by 12 and then close that parenthesis so we can apply the exponent and the exponent is going to be x for the number of payments then we're going to subtract one we're going to close the parenthesis on the numerator so I, yes, I see where I needed another set of parentheses because I needed one around the entire numerator. There's one, two, three, one. Actually, there's four, so there's one, two, three, four, and then that's going to be divided by 0 0.07 divided by 12. And that should be right. Ah, get enough parentheses in there to get it right. So the actual table should look like this. We'll just scroll. So initially she has no money in the bank. At the end of the first period, she put in her first payment. And her first payment was 249.56. At the end of the second period, she had $500.58. At the end of the third month, she has $753.06. And we're going to have to go all the way to the 240th month. And you can see her money's growing the whole time. So after three years, she's right at $10,000. And then right here at the end of five years, she's got not quite And at the end of 10 years, she's got $43,000, almost $44,000. And I'm tired of scrolling, so I'm going to go ask it for values. And ask it, what does she have at the end of 240 payments? And it says she has one hundred thirty thousand two dollars. Okay. If you didn't gain anything else from this, you gained the idea that you really don't want to do the formulas. Amen. Now my calculator doesn't want to shrink back down. Okay. Stack. And then what do you do is when you put the payment in at the beginning yes. of the period? You put it in at the beginning, yes. So here's another definition. 
And this is actually pretty close to the end of the problems. I think this is our last one. The, the formula we used is for ordinary annuities, which is the when the payments are made at the end. If your payments are made at the beginning of each time, beginning of each period, it's called an annuity due. And it's just a name. Ordinary is at the beginning, due is at the end. Now the difference in it is that if you do an ordinary annuity, you gain no interest on your last payment. If you do an annuity due, you gain no interest on your first payment because you're making it at the beginning of the time period, but it isn't going to actually gain you any interest. So the only real difference in the formula is that you actually increase your compounding by one. So in the last problem, instead of n being 240, it would have been 241. Essentially, though, the rest of the formula is exactly the same, except that you subtract off that one payment that you got no interest for. Now, your calculator will handle that formula for you, too. So we're not going to worry about the formula. We're going to look at the way that it's different if we're going to do an annuity due. And it really is only different in one place. So we're going to go to the finance formula and the TVM solver. And here our problem says that we're going to make payments of $500. At the beginning, of each period, not the end. So when we get down here to the bottom, we have to move from the end to begin. So that's where that came from. And then a compounded quarterly The account pays 6%. And since it's compounded quarterly, it is going to be four times your seven years. Which is going to make it 28. And then we're going to solve for the future value. So seven times four times a year at 6% interest. Your payment amount is $500. Future value is what we're going to solve for. And we're compounding quarterly, so that's going to be four. And then we go down and we change from the end by putting the cursor on the begin and pressing enter. That's what makes it an annuity due. And then go back up to your future value. And alpha solve. And it will be 17,000. dollars and 35 cents. That will be your future value. And if you're wondering which one's better, given the same circumstances, all you need to do is go down here and change from the beginning back to the end and look at an ordinary annuity with everything being the same. And you would have $17,000 still, but it would be $17,240 and 74 cents. 
So you'd have a little bit less money if it's ordinary. And the reason you'd have a little less money is because you're getting interest in this case on that very first payment and you're getting it for every single compounding after that. Okay? Your last payment gets interest as well because you're making it at the beginning of the period. So that's why you get a little bit more interest. So if you had the choice between an ordinary and an uh, annuity due, I would choose the annuity due if you could get the same terms. Any questions? Because I think we're pretty much done with this. Are you going to be able to pick out the information from the problem? We are finished and next time we will do mortgages we'll do something called the present value of, of an annuity what is your amount you know if you're putting in money right now to have this much in the future what lump sum deposit could you make right now to have that same amount as making those periodic payments is based on what present value is but the more useful part of section 5.3 is going to be talking about mortgages because mortgages aren't just your house payment. Mortgages are any loan payment where you make periodic payments and they charge you interest on every single balance at the end of every single payment period. So part of your actual payment goes toward the principal, but the rest of it goes toward the interest that's being charged on your balance. So it takes longer to pay off an amortized loan or amortized loan than it does if you have a loan made at simple interest. So I will see you next week and I will do my best to get your test papers graded as quickly as I can and have them ready to give back to you.